Galatians chapter 3 verses 1 through 11. I want to talk to us for a while today on the topic faith as a lifestyle. Faith as a lifestyle. Galatians chapter 3 verses 1 through 11. And there it is on the screen for those of you who are watching by reason of the internet today. And the word of the Lord reads today from the King James text. O oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only would I learn of you. Receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Have ye suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit, and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book for the law to do them. Verse 11, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident for the just shall live by faith. If you bow your heads with me a moment once again, as we go before the Lord in prayer, Master, once again, God, we come before you, humbling ourselves, desperately in need of a touch from heaven, requiring the anointing of the Holy Ghost, if this old feeble preacher is to be at all, beneficial to the people of God. No one, Lord, no one is more aware of their personal inability in and of himself than I. I grew up in this faith. I understand the work of the anointing. I understand the need of the anointing. Without the anointing, we're just loud mouths hollering a message that people hear with their ears but somehow it never reaches the deepest part of their heart but the anointing carries every word upon the wings of love and delivers it not to the hearing of the hearer but to the heart of the hearer help us O oh God today to be gleeful recipients of the Word of God, that you might be able to write this Word upon the tablet of our heart, 
that we might become and we might be living epistles read of all men. Oh, Master, use this word today to perfect us. Use this word to better us. Use this word to help us achieve a higher height and a deeper depth in you than we have ever before known. Touch the ear of every hearer as well, for we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Somebody convinced the Galatians that it was necessary for them to follow the rules and the edicts and the mandates of Moses' law if they were to be saved. Somebody convinced them that it was not enough to simply believe the gospel. It was not enough to obey the gospel as it had been set forth by the apostles. But rather, once you obeyed the gospel, you became then beholden to the law of Moses and all the rules and all the regulations of that law were also necessary to salvation. I got news for you. There are Christian churches in our world today, fundamentalist and evangelical churches, not to mention the Roman church, which teach salvation by reason of satisfying the mandates of the law. LGBT person, every time somebody points to Leviticus or Deuteronomy and quotes that passage to you, they are trying to convince you that you must satisfy the law, that faith is not sufficient, obedience to the gospel is not sufficient, but Paul said that those who seek to drag you back under the mandate of the law are seeking to bewitch you and beguile you. They are literally trying to deceive you. Why do they do this? Well, the answer is easy. Because they're deceived. If they knew the truth of God's word, if they knew the truth of the gospel, they wouldn't believe what they were saying either. But they believe that foolishness. The sad part of it is that they are fool enough to convince themselves that somehow they satisfy the whole of the law of Moses. Because according to the word of God, to fail at one single point of the law is to be guilty of every point of the law. Mm -hmm. So those who seek to drag you back under the weight, back under the torments, back under the yoke, of the law of Moses those who seek to drag you back under that bondage my friend are deceived in more ways than one first they're deceived in that they think that the law has any role in your salvation that's deception number one deception number two is they are nitwits who believe that somehow they have satisfied every single point of the law because if they haven't, then they too would be lost. And you would have uh, the blind leading the blind. Do you remember what Jesus said about the blind leading the blind and they both fall into a ditch? 
I got news for you, sweetie. That's what the contemporary fundamentalist and the evangelical church is. It's a bunch of blind people trying to lead the lost who are blind. And both of them fall into the same ditch. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Truth of the matter is, salvation, Paul tells us in our primary text, is a matter of faith. We become children and offspring, descendants of Abraham, not by reason of our nationality, not by reason of our physical heritage, but by reason of our faith. Because long before even the law had been established, oh hallelujah, God had established the immutable truth of faith through Abraham. Hallelujah. And therefore, faith came first, then the law. And then faith was restored. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to God. Did you hear me, children? Faith came first through Abraham. And then the law. And then through Christ Jesus, faith was restored. Glory to God. Your salvation today does not depend upon your ability to live up to some standard. It does not depend today upon your ability to somehow be perfect and make every right decision and do everything right and never fail and never falter and never sin. No, 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 no. For by grace are you he say through faith hallelujah through faith through faith by grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God not of works lest any man should boast if your ability to somehow make yourself straight is going to get you into heaven then when you get into heaven you'll be able to brag well I'm here because I was able to straighten myself out baloney anybody in heaven is going to be there for the same reason and one reason alone because of the grace of God hallelujah and because they were able to believe the promises of God's word glory to God they were able to put their confidence in this book not in Mr. Graham not in Mr. Swaggart I tell you, there are too many people, especially in the LGBT community today, who are backslidden away from God, and whether they want to recognize it or not, whether they want to man up and acknowledge it or not. You're not out of church because somebody hurt you. You're not out of church because somebody offended you. Sweetie, no. You're out of church because you don't believe the Word of God. Somebody convinced you to doubt it. Mm. Because my Bible said, Whosoever calleth upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Yes. Hallelujah. My Bible said that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Hallelujah. That's what my Bible, once you believe and obey the gospel, all you're required to do by the word of God is keep your faith. That's all you're required to do. Hold on 
come to your faith. Don't you let anybody tear it out of your hands. And certainly don't be fool enough to give it away. Amen. Somebody comes at me. You can't be a Christian because of who you are. I look at them and laugh. Why? Well, it's easy. Because what they just said applies to them too. They can't be a Christian because of who they are. Because who you are has nothing to do with your being a Christian. What has to do with your being a Christian is what you believe in your heart. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So when somebody comes to me wanting to preach an old law message, I look at them and say, O oh, foolish Galatian, who hath believed you that ye should not obey the truth. Hallelujah. Oh, glory. I want to tell you today, many believers live their lives as though faith is some mystical currency. We occasionally tap into in extraordinary times or when faced with otherwise insurmountable obstacles. As each situation requiring faith arises, these believers suddenly find themselves trying to find or trying to muster the faith to overcome and emerge victorious. But this, my friend, is not the true nature of a biblical believer's walk. Faith is a lifestyle. Faith is our first response, not our last resort. When opposition is raised, be it marital woes, Troubles related to our family or our children, sickness, frustrations at work, or any number of common daily struggles. We are always first cry out to God who is our refuge and our help. Hallelujah. In Psalm 121 we read I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. In Psalm 91 and 2 we read, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him will I trust. Psalm 91 in verse 9 declares, Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. In Psalm 94, verse 22, But the Lord is my defense, and my God is the rock of my refuge. In Psalm 46, 1 through 3, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. Hallelujah. Faith is a lifestyle. That is where we first 
go. Somebody wants you to question your salvation. Somebody wants you to question your ability to be saved. Honey, go to faith. Hallelujah. Are you going to believe them or are you going to believe the Word of God? Make your choice. How many have quit God? How many have quit church? How many have quit trying to live for the Lord? All because they believe the preacher instead of the one being preached. How many have left God? How many have backslidden? How many today are in drugs and alcohol and all kinds of hideous situations involving addiction and trouble? All because... They believed what was preached instead of the one who was preached. My Lord, have mercy. Children, I'm here to tell you there are some in our world today, particularly unbelievers, who have mused that preaching is little more than cheerleading. I've heard unbelievers, people not in church and all them preachers, all they do is get up and rah rah and cheerlead and stir up the audience. Yes, sometimes that's exactly what it is. Sometimes that's exactly what God's people need. If God's people are going to remain on the pathway of faith, they sometimes need some cheerleading. That's but one reason why we go to church. The Word of God declares in Romans 10, 17, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing, 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 not reading, not seeing, hearing by the Word of God. While circumstances may overwhelm us, in the house of God we are reminded through the hearing of the preached word of God that we have the victory if we want it. Hallelujah. And the battle belongs to the Lord. Glory to the name of Jesus. Why is the preached word more effective than the read word? Why is it more effective when we hear it preached rather than when we simply read it. Because preaching delivered with anointing, preaching delivered with passion and authority reaches down into our spirit and encourages and inspires us in ways that simply reading words upon a page cannot. I'm going to tell you Amy and Clint and I were talking, we were visiting at a sandwich shop in Wichita the other day, having lunch, and we were talking about uh, sports and what have you, you know. And uh, I told them, I said, well, I, one time Tommy's job gave him tickets for a hockey match in Dallas, and we got to go see the Dallas Stars play. Now, I have about as much interest in hockey as I have dropping dead at the side of this pulpit right now. I really don't care about hockey. But they have a private box, so it was quite an unusual and quite a neat experience. And I said, yeah, you know what, for kicks, let's go. We'll see what it's, you know, well, well what, why not? You know, we'll just give it a try. It'll be an experience, I'm sure. We went to that game, and of course I won't tell you how neat the box was and having a private little room of your own to view the game from. And they had that little balcony, you know, with the seats out in front so you can go sit, but then you can get up, come back, get you some food and drink and what have you. And But I'm going to tell you something. I guarantee you that nobody feels watching a hockey game on television the same way they would feel if they were in the stadium watching. 
Why? I'll tell you why. Because, honey, they used that music. They got that organist up there. And they got somebody on the loudspeaker announcing points made and penalties and what have you. And, oh, they're up there announcing all this. And the, the guy on the organ is pounding out his little, da, 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 you know. And people are cheering and people are yelling and hollering and carrying on. And my, how they stir you up. Got news for you. All you fans watching on television, you're not doing one stinking thing for any of the players on the ice. The only people having any impact on the players are those who made the effort, paid the price, and are in the stands. Got news for you folks. Sitting at home and watching our service doesn't help me one stinking bit. Doesn't do one thing for the preacher. Doesn't encourage me. Doesn't lift me up. Doesn't help me to get up here and do what God's called me to do. No! Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Got news for you. You don't never, I don't care how good sitting at home you feel like church is. You know what? You'd have got twice as much out of it if you'd have been here instead. That's right. Of course, we got people who don't understand the gifts of the Spirit. They don't understand the move of the Holy Ghost. They don't understand the presence of God. The Word of God said, where two or more are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Mm -hmm. God's the one who designed the church house, folks. This is not man's invention. God designed that the church work this way. And if you think you can make your faith in God work without the physical church, you, my friend, are deceived. You've allowed the enemy to convince you that you can separate yourself from the pack and you'll still be safe and you'll still be uh, able to avoid harm or injury. No, you can not. That's why when one sheep was lost, in spite of the fact that there were 99 already in the fold, the shepherd went out to find that one that was lost. He could leave, listen to me, he could leave the 99 in the fold and they'd be safe. Just by reason of the fact that they were gathered together. You see, a wolf, a bear, a lion isn't going to attack one of the sheep that are part of the group. That's not how they hunt. They look for the weak ones. They look for the sick ones. They look for those who have been injured. They look for those who have separated themselves from the rest. Therefore, in his parable, Jesus said the shepherd left the ninety and nine. Isn't that what he said? And he went out and looked for the one. Why? Because that one was the dingling who thought they didn't have to go to church. That one was the person who thought that it was not necessary to be part of the fellowship. That one was the one who sat at home and said, I can serve God. I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. There's a reason 
God designed this thing to work the way that he designed it. Preaching, anointed preaching, is far more powerful than merely reading the words off the page. How much more powerful is it when we hear the preacher exclaim, Come on, believer! Pick yourself up and battle onward! The war is not over until the last of our enemies lay dead. The final chapter has already been written and nothing in this world can defeat you when you walk by faith. Hallelujah. 1 John 5 and 4 For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. You cannot sometimes walk by faith and other times walk by sight. The only way to walk in the Spirit, to walk in victory, is to learn the discipline of faith walking. Faith must be your lifestyle. If faith is your lifestyle, you know why the old timers went to church every Sunday night and Wednesday night? You know why they were so faithful? I attended a church growing up as a kid. I'm gonna tell you, if somebody, if some of, if one of our regular people wasn't in church, we were making phone calls. We thought maybe they dropped dead somewhere because literally, 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 the people I grew up in were faithful to a fault. If they weren't gonna be in church, they'd call and tell somebody. They call uh, Brother Obar, call my grandmother, say, Sister Bell, let folks at church know that I'm on vacation and we're going to Disney World. So they don't worry about me when they don't see me in church today. My grandmother would tell the pastor, my husband and I are going to a wedding out of town this week so I won't be in church Sunday. I'll tell you, God's people at one time were so faithful it's not even funny. Did you hear the word I used? Faithful. If faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, if going to the house of God and fueling up on your faith is how God designed this thing to work, then let me ask you a little question. How can faith be your lifestyle? Oh, my Lord, have mercy. How can it be your lifestyle when you don't have yourself disciplined to be faithful to the house of God to keep your faith topped off? I'm going to tell you, I know too many people they get sick. All of a sudden the doctor says they have cancer. He says there's nothing I can do for you. We'll just have to make you as comfortable as we can make you. And all of a sudden they decide it's time to go to church. Or all of a sudden they decide it's time to call out to God or to turn to God or to pray. All of a sudden they're trying to find the faith to believe God for a miracle. <laughs> I've preached this for years. Tommy's heard it so he'll know what I'm about to say. Honey, if you wait until you need the faith for a miracle, if you wait until you need the faith for deliverance, if you wait until you need the faith for a healing, before you even start looking for it, you're not going to win the battle, trust me. You cannot find faith 
When you're in the middle of your trial, you cannot find faith. When you're in the middle of your temptation, you cannot find faith. When you're in the middle of your sickness or your disease, you cannot find faith. When your back's against the wall, you need to go into battle with your faith intact so that anything the enemy throws at you, you can repel with the shield of faith. Hallelujah. You better have faith locked up in your spirit before you wind up on that hospital bed. You better have faith in your spirit before the doctors tell you there is no hope. You better have faith before they've called in hospice. You better have faith before you have to go into that courtroom. Before your marriage starts experiencing troubles. Before your child gets hooked on drugs. Oh, I could go down a list a mile long. These are things that happen to people every day. People who say that will never happen to me, they're the ones it happens to. And if you don't have faith, Stored up if you don't have your faith intact when these circumstances come upon you good luck finding faith in the middle of that struggle I've been I've been called stubborn I've been called old-fashioned. I've had people say all kinds of things about this old preacher because I don't play games. And I'm going to tell you something. I don't have time for people that play games. I can't stand game-playing people. If you're not going to do this thing and do it right, then do it somewhere else. Because I haven't got time to play with people who don't know how to play this thing the way it's meant to be played. Well, I'm going to tell you, I've had, in the last four years, I've had doctors come to me. My God, how many times, Booby? Too many. Too many! Telling me something more! Another battle, another war I have to fight! Diabetes! Kidney failure! Leukemia! Liver disease. And every time they've come to me and told me something, have you ever heard me say, well, maybe it's time I retire. Maybe it's time I quit preaching. I've got too many ailments. I've got too many sicknesses. I've got too much coming against my body for me to, to have to try to keep doing what I've been doing without support with a bunch of people who don't know how to be supportive. Have you heard me say it one time, Tommy, when the doctor gave me this news? No, sir! In 2000, I was so sick that I was convinced I was dying, literally. I kept praying for God to heal me, and for whatever reason, the Lord would not heal me. And I thought, well, I guess maybe it's just my time to go. And I had almost given up entirely on the notion of a healing. So I thought, well, I'm going to move out of New York City. I'm going to move back to Connecticut, the state I grew up in. Uh, and I'm going to that way. If I die, my family doesn't have to come to New York to claim my body. There was a man in Connecticut who asked me, a member of the LGBT community, Harry said, if you ever leave New York, would you consider coming to Connecticut and starting a work in Connecticut? 
I was sick as a mule. I had been ministering in New York for some six, seven years. So what did I do? Move to my home state, pack up my bags, hole up in my apartment and wait to die? No! God called me to preach. God called me to the ministry. I'm going to do what the Lord called me till the day I die because this old preacher has got some stubborn faith. Faith for me is a lifestyle. I don't have to look for faith when I'm sick. My God have mercy. That sickness had better look out for me because I'm coming in with my faith fully intact. I said, live or die. I'm going to work for Jesus till he comes or until I die one. I called Harry said, you ready to start having church? And we started to work. For it's all said and done, I lost half my body weight. Wound up in the hospital for two months on life support for a month. God gave me a miracle. Literally brought me out of that hospital. Guess what I did when I got out of the hospital? Did I quit? Did I tell everybody, sorry guys, we're going to have to close up the church we started because I'm too sick. I, I'm, I can barely eat half a sandwich. That's the most I could eat was, uh, honestly, about a quarter of a sandwich was about all I could eat at that time. I had no appetite. After being on life support for a month, my stomach was the size of a marble. They kept telling me, you need to eat, you need to eat, you need your strength, you need to get your weight back. I couldn't eat. Had absolutely no appetite. Got out of the hospital, I was still on various drugs that they had me on while I was on life support. Took about a month for those drugs to clear out of my system. As soon as those drugs cleared out of my system, ask Carrie Gifford. Not a month later, not two months later, not six months later, as soon as those drugs, as soon as the doctor gave me the all clear, we started having church again. I had to do it in my living room. I had to preach sitting in my recliner because I didn't have the strength to stand up. Oh, preacher, you're telling us how wonderful you are. No, I'm not. I'm telling you what faith as a lifestyle looks like. I'm telling you what it looks like when people know how to be faithful in spite of any and every circumstance and situation that may come their way. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Faith, my walk with God. This, this isn't something I, I play on Sunday and then mess around with Monday through Saturday. No, no, no. It's a lifestyle, folks. You can't walk by faith sometimes and walk by sight other times. We saw what that looked like in Matthew 14, 25 through 31. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer in his eye. Be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, 
if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he, meaning Jesus, said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. That's living by faith sometimes. But here comes the living in the flesh. Here comes the not living by faith but living by sight. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, Listen, O thou of little faith, Wherefore didst thou doubt? They were not even on the boat yet. And the Lord was chastising him for his lack of faith. That's what it looks like when you walk by faith sometimes and you walk by sight other times. Got news for you. Such a walk does not please God. Such a walk does not make the Lord happy. You didn't see the Lord grabbing Peter by the arm and say, Well, good man, you were able to walk on the water with me for at least a little while. No, he chastised him for his unbelief. It's only when we learn to live by faith and walk in faith that we, like the Apostle Paul, will be able to declare in the midst of the most perilous circumstance. Philippians 1.21 For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Doctors, psychologists came in to me during the summer of 2000 while I was in the hospital before my two month hospital I went through three hospitalizations that summer I was in for a week out in for two weeks out in for another week out a few weeks later I went in for two months on life support for a month but during that first couple of visits they didn't know if I was going to live or die they weren't sure if I, they didn't know what was going on with me, and psychologists from Yale New Haven Hospital would come in, and they would say to me, Sir, are you aware that you may die? And I looked at him and said, Yep. How does that make you feel? I said, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I live, I won. If I die, I won. I said, Honey, they ain't a losing hand in the deck. It doesn't matter to me one way or the other. I'm ready to go. And I mean, when I tell you I say I'm ready to go, I mean I'm ready to go. I'm not putting on a show. I'm not playing a game. Faith is my lifestyle. Hallelujah. This thing is real to me. When I'm staring down the barrel of the gun and death is threatening me, I'm able to say with Paul, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I don't have to find faith in the moment because I went into the moment with my faith intact. Either way, Paul knew for certain he was the winner. The truest test of our faith lies not in how we face death, but rather in how we confront life. Few may be present as we depart this world, but many will have witnessed how we lived our lives. 2 Timothy 4, 6-8, my last scripture for today. Paul wrote, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. 
I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. I'll tell you something, folks. Nobody can take my faith from me. Nobody can convince me that I am not saved. Nobody can move me from my conviction that faith and obedience to the gospel bring salvation to all who will believe. My faith is stubborn. My faith is unmovable. My faith is a way of life. I'm talking about faith as a lifestyle. Hallelujah. Praise.